Hi, I'm Chad, and welcome to the first workshop video in my new garage. So today we are going to be checking and if necessary, adjusting the valve clearances on my 2012 Triumph Daytona 675R race bike, as well as replacing the timing chain. So just to give you a little bit of background on the bike, it is again a 2012 Triumph Daytona 675R. I've had this bike now for about three years, a little over three years, closer to three and a half and I've put about 5,000 miles on it on my own, a little bit over that, maybe 5,300 miles. Of those 5,300 miles, about 27, 2,800 of them have been on track and racing. So this bike has lived a very hard life as of late. Now, the standard valve clearance check interval for this motorcycle is 12,000 miles, and I did actually check the valves back at the 12,000 mile mark. I need to do just three of them, but because this is just a dedicated race bike and has been this way for almost two years now, it would behoove me to just check, make sure everything is still in spec because when this bike is ridden, it is always ridden hard. It is always high in the rev range. It's being downshifted aggressively. It gets a lot of use. And as such, things are going to wear a lot faster than they would under your normal street riding conditions. Hence the reason for the check today. I am also replacing the cam chain just as a preventative measure. They don't have a high tendency to fail. I actually had a 2006 Daytona 675 before I had this bike that had 36,000 miles on it on the original cam chain and it never snapped. So he seemed to be fairly reliable, but again, just because it is a race bike and is just being ridden hard when it is ridden constantly, I think it would be nice to just throw that in there. And that'll also help us to ensure that we can get the timing just right between the camshafts and the crankshaft. So before we get started, a couple things you should know about this job. First, you're going to need to check your valve clearance specs with the engine completely cold. So before you do this job, let the bike cool down for at least, I'd say six hours overnight if possible. Let it get stone cold, ideally no temperature showing on the gauge if you've got a bar or just whatever your ambient air temperature is. If you try to do this with the engine hot or warm, your measurements are not going to be accurate and you're not going to be able to put the valve clearances in the proper spec or even really know if they're in the proper spec to begin with. That's just because as engine parts, metal, fluids, all that stuff heats up, it expands a little bit, so those clearances can change. So again, make sure you do this on a cold engine. The next, while I'm happy to make this video to share it as a resource, I've often found it's a lot more helpful to actually see things get done rather than to see photographs of these taken, posted on a forum, in an instruction manual, something like that. I am a hobbyist, I'm not a professional mechanic, so I don't accept any responsibility if you go and adjust your valves, do any kind of work on your motorcycle based on this video, and mess something up. That said, I'd also like to recommend that you go and buy either a factory service manual or a Haynes service manual for your Daytona 675 or whatever motorcycle you're doing this job on. It's an incredible resource, has torque specs, instructions for doing a huge variety of jobs, not just the valve clearance check and adjustment. Truly awesome resource. I'll drop a link down in the description below to the service manual for this bike. Definitely be sure to get a copy of that before you start this job, especially if you're doing it for the first time. It's like 35 or 40 bucks and honestly, it's so worth the investment. Now, before you start working on your bike, I would definitely take your time planning everything out. Make sure that you have all the replacement parts that you're going to need. We're gonna need a new cam cover seal. We're gonna need a new timing cover seal. You might as well replace your spark plugs at this point, even if they were replaced maybe five, 6,000 miles ago, just to be on the safe side of things. Good opportunity to replace your air filter. You're also going to need a means of keeping track of your measurements when you are checking the valve clearances. So I use this worksheet actually. I found this on triumph675.net many years ago. Credit to the guy that made this. I can't remember his username, but I've had this saved on my computer ever since. I just print one of these out every time I do the valves. Super easy to keep track of, keep a pen handy, and then you can cross out and put in your new clearances too. Once you have adjusted the valves, put everything back together and go back to do your recheck. I'll go ahead and throw a screenshot of this up on the screen right now. Feel free to pause the video, go full screen, take a screenshot of this so that you have it for reference. I'll also take a look, see if I can find that thread again on triumph675.net, drop a link to it down in the description below. Now, if you've never worked on a motorcycle before, this is definitely not a job you're gonna wanna try to do on your own. Definitely change your oil first, do cooling system flushes, change your spark plugs, your air filter, get comfortable getting into the bike little by little. We're going to be removing quite a bit from this motorcycle to be able to access the cam cover and the cylinder head. 
including the fuel tank. And because my bike is a race bike and it's only really three pieces, this tail piece all the way up to here is one section. We've got the belly pan, which is one piece, and then the front cowl and fairing with the windscreen. So everything is gonna be coming off of the bike. But if you have a street bike, you're not gonna need to remove your tail fairing and you're not gonna need to remove the front cowl, just the side fairings and the seat and the fuel tank. So a couple specialty things that we're gonna need outside of just your standard mechanics toolkit, which if you don't have one of those, I would definitely recommend going and buying one before you start working on your bike. You're going to need a Torx bit to get the velocity stacks out so that you can remove the air box, access the throttle bodies and the cam cover. I believe it's a T25, but I'll throw it up here on the screen once I've confirmed for sure. Outside of that, you're gonna need a socket for the crankshaft to be able to rotate it. That, I believe, is a 17 millimeter. Again, I'll confirm up above here. But outside of that, you are gonna need a few specialty tools, including these, which are feeler gauges. So these are just really thin pieces of metal that have assigned thickness to them. And I mean, they're really thin. You almost can't differentiate between some of these. But this is what we're going to use to measure the clearance between the heel of the cam lobe and the valve bucket that covers the shim, the valve spring, the valve spring retainer, and all that good stuff. That's how we're going to know how much of an adjustment we need to make to get everything back in spec. And then we can remove the cam retainer, pull the cams out, get the buckets out, measure the shims that we have in there, do the calculations we need to figure out which shims need to go in there to set the clearances correctly, put those in, and put everything back together. So something I recommend buying before this is a shim kit. I've got a hot cam shim kit. There's a wide variety of shims in here that are specifically for the Daytona 675. The shim diameter, if I remember correctly, is 7.48 millimeters. However, having this kit does not guarantee that you are going to have every shim that you need. The hot cam shim kits, if I remember, go to hundredths of a millimeter. You might find yourself in a situation where you're off by five thousandths of a millimeter, in which case you're gonna to have to go to your Triumph dealer or somewhere else to see if you might be able to trade shims with them and get the shim that you need, or just go place an order for that shim. And your Triumph dealer will be able to help you out there. So the last specialty item that we're gonna need for this job is some engine assembly lube. This is going to be key for when we are putting the cams back in the cylinder head, bolting them down with the cam retainer, because the cam journals, the cam lobes, basically everything that moves and has friction against other parts is going to need to be protected and lubricated for when you go to start the engine up for the first time after this job. We're gonna clean out the surfaces and everything so there's not gonna be any oil left in there. You can try to use motor oil to do this, but I just recommend assembly lube. It's going to do a much better job of providing that cold start protection and it's just going to melt away and dissolve within your engine oil. So because this is a complicated job and is gonna take a lot of time, I'm not gonna go through all of the intricacies of just like removing the bodywork and stuff. If you are taking on a job like this, you should be very comfortable doing that yourself already. But once we get the tank off and everything, we'll take a look at the air box, we'll open that up look at the velocity stacks, show you how to get those out. And then from there, we'll work our way down to the throttle bodies, and then the cam cover. So with that, let's go ahead and get started and time-lapse. And just like that, bike is fully there and we're ready to proceed. So let's get acquainted real quick. This is your air box. That's gonna be where your air filter is located as well as the velocity stacks, which run down into the throttle bodies and into the intake side of the cylinder head. There are eight small wood screws here. They're seven millimeters. Be very careful with these. They will strip out the plastic, especially when you're putting them back in guy right here, it's around that wire. This is your ECU. There's a couple different ways you can do this. You can just take the top half of the air box off, do it, undo all the bolts, slap it over to the side, throw it out of the way, or you can actually disconnect the ECU, 
take everything and just go and put it somewhere else so that it's not hanging off to the side of the bike by the wires. That is what I am going to do. So we're also going to disconnect the negative terminal of the battery just to make sure nothing funky happens to the ECU. And uh, yeah, oh, by the way, that's the quick shifter sensor. If you have a quick shifter on your bike, that is OEM from Triumph. All right, so now that we have the lid of the airbox off, let's see our throttle bodies here, beautiful. Want to be very, very careful not to get anything in those because when these are open, they go straight into the cylinder head of your engine. Can't see that very well there on the camera, but good to throw shop towels to plug these up for the meantime, definitely the throttle bodies. We're gonna do that too when we remove the throttle bodies block up the passages to the cylinder head with shop towels. But these are where the Torx bolts are, down in here. There's one there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. The velocity stacks come out individually. And then there's this last bolt that's up here on the top, right there. That secures the bottom half of the airbox to the frame. So once the velocity stacks are out and that bolt is off, you can just pull the airbox out kind of up and back towards the rear of the bike should come out without too much trouble but do again be careful don't want to break anything kind of key with this is just patience and being careful with stuff but let's go ahead and get the airbox out of here if you are going to change your air filter pretty easy to do it's right here one screw two screw three screw and there's three screws all down there right in that area right here there. there. Filter just comes right out, put the new one in, put the screws back in, you're good to go. You can do that with the air box in the bike, with it out of the bike, doesn't really matter, but you don't need to remove the air filter to pull the air box out. I just replaced my air filter about a month ago, so maybe two months ago. So it should be pretty clean still, I'm not going to worry about it at this point in time. Now let's get this bottom half of the air box out. And now the airbox is out. So before we pull the throttle bodies, just wanna go over a couple things I forgot to mention. There are vacuum lines here. These are for the crankcase breathers. Um, there are little clamps that you have to pinch, slide down to be able to get these off of the airbox. Same with this one here. Let me go ahead and plug those up in a sec, but there was also a vacuum line down here. That is for this connector which plugged into the kind of a solenoid I think for the vacuum pressure because this is a vacuum line and this runs down all the throttle bodies but uh, before we take the throttle bodies out here it's a little dirty under here so I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up we just don't want to get any dirt or grime or any kind of junk inside the engine and since we are gonna be removing the cam cover right here in a little bit Definitely want to make sure that everything is nice and clean so we don't run the risk of dirt getting in there because that is going to be very, very bad if it happens. All right, next steps now that we're all nice and cleaned out here, we're going to remove the throttle bodies. So there are hose clamps that hold these things on. They're pretty tough to see. You can see right there. Not right there, right there. So tricky to get to, 
In my experience, the best way to get to those is to use a very narrow extension or to use a hex key that has the long side. There's one on each of the throttle bodies. They might be directioned differently depending on whether or not your bike's ever been serviced or just how it was put together. If I remember correctly, this one and this one face that way. And then I actually flipped the clip on this guy over here to face out this way to make it a little bit easier to reach when I am doing this service. So I might have to remove the coolant overflow tank. I don't remember. I'm gonna try without doing that first. And if I have to, so be it. But we're getting there. After the throttle bodies are out, we'll remove all this stuff. This is for the crankcase breather, including this valve right here. I've already gone ahead and unplugged that. That's what this hose is to. This is another breather hose. So pretty straightforward. There's bolt here, bolt there. And this one's got bolt here and bolts yep, up there. So we'll undo those, take that whole assembly out, get that out of the way. And then we'll disconnect the harness for the ignition coils, get those out. Gonna change the spark plugs while we're at it too. But after that, we will simply loosen up the mounting bracket for the radiator here, take that bolt out so that we can push this forward a little bit, give us a little bit more clearance once we have the cam cover off, well, to get the cam cover off and then also to measure the clearances for the exhaust valves. But that's the plan. So let's get back to the time-lapse. All right, so the throttle bodies are not completely out, but they are out of the way enough that we can work. And I did go ahead and pull the ignition coils. We've got this last one right here. Boom. Spark plug. So yeah, looking good so far at this point, just been being careful, of course, cleaning more things as I have seen dirt before unearthing them, I guess, or exposing any area of the engine, like the spark plug wells, for example. So clean it up as we go little by little, little hidden dirt in there. But I also had to remove, there's a bracket that goes right here that actually supports the fairing. So I just took the bolts off that, spun it out of the way. Good to go. So all we've got now are the six bolts that secure the cam cover. There is one, two, three over here side got four right there five all the way down here and number six over there in the corner after that cam cover should just lift up and slide right out might be helpful to remove this bracket for the fairing as well just to give you the added clearance but after that we will go ahead and pull the timing cover off here so we have access to the bolt on the crankshaft that'll allow us to turn the crank but we're getting pretty close to taking our clearances here Going smoothly. And in case you ever wanted to see down into the head of your engine, take that out real quick. It's pretty dark in there, but you go down deep now. Some little shiny bits of the valves. So yeah, make sure you plug up these passageways because there are ports directly into your engine's valves and combustion chamber, and you definitely do not want to get anything in there. All right, so time cover is off. 
This nut on the crankshaft is exposed. That is how we are going to turn the engine. It is a 24 millimeter nut. So get a 24 millimeter socket and preferably a breaker bar. Gonna make it a lot easier because you are going to be working against some compression forces unless you remove the spark plugs. Here we have the cam gears. These bolt onto the cam shafts that are secured by this piece. The cam retainer, I believe is what it's called. So how an engine works. You have your cam gears here. These are bolted onto the camshafts, which control the timing of your valves in the cylinder head, the opening and closing timing. And then down here, this nut is bolted to the crankshaft. So what happens is the crankshaft drives this whole mechanism. So as combustion occurs within the engine, piston is driven down and it turns the crankshaft, which drives this chain, which turns the cams. So this is critical because this controls the timing of your engine. And if your engine is not timed correctly, you run the risk of valves being open when a piston is going up, then colliding. And if your timing is off even just a little bit, it can reduce your performance as well, even if it's not off to the degree that pistons and valves would make contact. So as the crankshaft spins, and it spins on this engine in a clockwise direction, so this way, the crankshaft spins, which turns the cam gears and the cam shafts, and they open and close the valves with these eccentric cam lobes up here. So you notice this is kind of taller than some of the other stuff that's on here. This valve, or these two valves actually, are completely closed right now. So what happens is when the camshafts turn, the eccentric part of this lobe will go and press down on the valve bucket. Kind of hard to see there, but it's down below that kind of circular looking thing. But underneath that bucket is the valve shim, which sits on top of the valve stem. You've got valve springs under there too and retainers. So by default with that spring, the valves are going to want to close, but these force them open. So the air and fuel on this side of the engine, this being the intake side, can enter the engine to be combusted. And then the valves on the other side will open when it is time for the exhaust gases resulting from that combustion to run out of the engine through the exhaust and out into the world. So we're checking the clearances between the heel of the cam lobe and the valve bucket when the valves are closed. So pretty easy to do this. We've got fueler gauges here. Like I said, just a very thin piece of metal stamped with a thickness on it. So all we're gonna do is take this and slide it in between the heel of the cam lobe and the valve bucket while the valve is closed like so. See that underneath there? It's a little tight going in, but once it's in, good clearance. And this is a 0.15 millimeter feeler gauge. So that's great because that means this valve is dead in the center of spec for this engine. The spec for this engine is 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters for the intake valves and 0.325 to 0.375 for the exhaust valves. We'll check this one as well. Again, just slide it right in. A little tight going in, but comes out fairly easily. That's with the 0.15. So both of these valves are in spec as far as the clearances go. I'm gonna repeat the process on the rest of the valves as we turn the engine, because we're gonna have to do that to get valves open and closed. So I'll show you what that looks like real quick. Get the socket right on there on the bolt. Again, engine goes clockwise. So we're gonna turn it clockwise. Do not under any circumstances turn this engine counterclockwise because what happens is this is the loaded side of the chain. There's a lot of tension here. And if you go counterclockwise, it's gonna take the tension off the side of the chain and tighten up this side. What can happen there is as the slack shifts in the chain, which is taken up by the cam chain tensioner, I have a manual in here by APE, the the shift in the chain slack can actually cause you to skip teeth, either on the crank or on the cam gears, which will put your engine out of time, which would be a bummer if all of your valves are in spec, because the way that you are going to put it back in time is by removing this cam retainer, which has 16 bolts securing it to the head of the engine and a specific torque pattern, so as not to bend the metal so real quick, just wanna talk you through untorquing the cam holder. So this is the loosening sequence for the bolts. 
The key here is you're not going to loosen each bolt all the way at once. You're gonna do each one a little bit at a time in this order. It's gonna take a while. You're gonna to need to make probably somewhere between five and 10 passes at each to get them loose enough where the bolts are out of the threads. But you wanna do this to be sure that you don't twist the cam holder because it does need to go back on pretty square and stay straight to hold the cams in place properly. So just take your time with this, be careful and make sure that you're following the sequence little by little. So see these two cam lobes up here, they are currently pressed down on the buckets a little bit. So these valves are partially open, but as the crankshaft turns, they move up. Eventually coming to the top, there, where the valves are closed. So then we can measure the clearances here between, again, the heel of the cam lobe, the non-eccentric side of it, and that valve bucket. And that's gonna allow us to get the measurements for our clearances. And then if we need to make any adjustments, we are going to have to untorque this, again, in that specific torque pattern order. We're gonna have to pull the slack out of the cam chain. If you have the original cam chain tensioner, you're gonna just need to remove that. Be sure to get a new gasket for this if you have that. If you have the APE, you can just loosen it up, take the slack out of the chain. But everything's gonna be out of time. You're gonna have to pull the camshafts out. You're gonna have to remove the valve buckets once the cams are out. Take the shim out of either the stem or sometimes it'll just stick in the bucket. Check the thickness of that with a caliper, a digital caliper, or just anything that can measure thickness very accurately. Figure out what shims you're going to need to put the clearances within spec, swap out for those shims, put everything back together, torque it back together, check your specs again, and hopefully everything will be right. So this is also one of the trickiest parts of this job because you just have to go based on feeling here. The feeler gauge should be tight when it goes in, but you shouldn't need to force it. If you're forcing it, it's probably a little bit looser than that. And of course, if you just can't get it in there, it's a lot looser than that. So you're going for whatever feeler gauge just kind of clicks in and slides in without too much ease, but at the same time too, especially as you get to the exhaust valves, it can be a little bit tricky just because of the angle that the engine is at and how you have to bend the feeler gauge to get it underneath the cam lobe. Also, another fun tip with the Daytona 675 engine or the triple engines that are in Triumphs, you only need to turn the crankshaft three times because as two valves on the intake side are open, two valves on the exhaust side are open. Obviously not on the same cylinder, but for example, we're at top dead center right now. We have the intake valves on cylinder number two closed. So heel of the cam lobe is facing the valve buckets. We can measure that. But over here on cylinder number three, actually, we have, it's kind of tough to see, but if you can look right there. There's one cam lobe. You can see that it is pointed straight up, meaning that we can measure the two valves that are on cylinder number three as well. And also for reference, if you're using the service manual, cylinder one, cylinder two, cylinder three. And then something else to note too, when you are turning the crankshaft, be sure to turn it slowly. The breaker bar makes this nice and easy to do, but you don't wanna turn it really quickly because you don't wanna have the compression snap back on you, especially if you're using a smaller breaker bar or a socket of some sort. It might feel a little bit jerky. That's again, just because you're compressing air. And also you'll hear some hissing and some other noises coming from the crankcase. That's totally normal. It's just pressure relieving itself as the engine is turning. So don't be alarmed by that. But again, take your time while turning the engine. So another nice little trick with the Triumph engine, because it only has three cylinders and the way that they are timed, you only need to turn the engine three times to be able to measure all 12 valves. So for example, we're up at top dead center here right now and the intake valves on cylinder number two are closed. So heel of the cam lobe is facing the bucket. We can measure that clearance. But if you look over here, and it's kind of tricky to see, let me zoom in a little bit. This cam lobe right here is up. I don't know if you can see it on the other side there. But that means that the exhaust valve on cylinder number three is also closed or both exhaust valves on cylinder three. So heel of the cam lobe is facing the bucket. We can measure the clearance there. So as you turn the engine, 
Every time you have a set of intake valves that's closed, there's going to be a set of exhaust valves that's closed. So if you're careful in how you do this, again, you only need to turn the engine three times. So it makes it pretty easy to check your clearances in a timely manner. And again, just at the same time, be sure to take your time turning the crankshaft so as not to let it walk back a little bit. But we're gonna start at top dead center here. As you can see, we're aligned perfectly with the camshafts. There's these little timing marks right here. Those should be aligned with the head of the engine. See how they fold in right there at the line? So that's nice and aligned. Intake cam, it's the one the nut's on. It's gonna be intake on the outside, exhaust on the outside, on the exhaust side. So that's how you know if you need a frame of reference or just aren't super confident in taking the cams out or anything, you can always just mark these with a, a Sharpie or some kind of dissolvable marker. But moving down here, show you how to check to see if your engine is at top dead center on the crankshaft. We've got the timing mark for the crankshaft. It's this kind of nozzle thing right here that's not flat with the rest of the engine. And then if you look at the gear back there, you'll see there's a circle. There's that little dot that's imprinted into the gear. That's actually the crankshaft timing mark. So as you can see here, mine's not aligned perfectly. So if yours doesn't quite line up, it's okay. Your engine's not gonna explode, but it should be pretty close there. Definitely no more, definitely no further away than this. But this is one of the reasons I'm replacing my cam chain actually, is because the chain is stretched enough where I can't get the engine into the top dead center on the crankshaft. So hoping the new chain's gonna remedy that. But let's go ahead, check the clearances and see if we need to pull the cams out. Well, that was a nice surprise because all of my valves are dead in the center of spec. Again, that spec is 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters of clearance for the intake valves and 0.325 to 0.375 for the exhaust valves, specifically on this bike. The exhaust valve clearance spec varies from the early Daytona 675 models to the older ones. And then the street triples actually have their own set of clearances as well. So definitely refer to your service manual to double check on those, but I'm stoked because all of my valves are in spec after 3000 miles of this bike just being beat on on racetracks. So because of that, I'm wondering if I might be able to get the cam chain out without removing the cams. Ordinarily, that is something that you're gonna have to do, but there are those additional holes that are drilled in the cam gears so you can play with your timing a little bit. So I wonder if I zip tied those together if maybe I could hold the cams in place so that I can just get the chain out without having to remove the cams. So I'm gonna give that a shot, see if it works. Worst case, we're gonna need to take the cams out anyways. So let's go ahead and do it.
All right, so we gave the zip tie thing a shot, but unfortunately with the cam chain guides and the nuts actually that, or the bolts I should say, that secure the cam gears to the camshafts, I was unable to get the chain out of here with all that stuff still in place. So pulled the cam cover, everything's out of there. Here's what it looks like. These are the buckets I was mentioning before. So a little, a little scoring, but nothing too bad. Kind of normal engine wear for uh, an engine that's harped on and isn't serviced after every race, which that's okay. The engine was running great before this, so I just wanted to see if you know it was time to do maintenance, but I couldn't notice any change in performance, and now it's clear why, because all of my clearances were in spec. So we're gonna go ahead and replace the cam chain. I have to take my frame slider off, unfortunately, or I shouldn't say my frame slider because I don't have a slider mounted to it, but the bracket for my frame slider, to take this off, there's a little bolt underneath here. It runs all the way through the block and locks the chain so that I can't go flying around in there. So, can you get all that stuff out? And then, once we do that, put the new chain in, put the camshafts back in, get everything all timed up nice and proper, and bolt it up. This is what we're looking at here. Again, I don't need to adjust any of my clearances, so not a big deal. But shop towels in here to block the spark plug bungs. But yeah, a little bit of wear. That black stuff right there is leftover assembly lube from the last time I did my valves actually. Pretty surprising that it stayed in there that long. But um, yeah, there's a little bit over there too. Better to have lube than no lube. But yeah, uh, everything looks pretty good though. Not really any additional scoring. There is a little bit of scoring. There's gonna be on these journal surfaces and everything. Um, same with like the valve buckets and the camshafts, the camshaft journals, the lobes, all that. It's not a big deal. Um, I just feel it a little bit. They should, light scratching's okay, but if you've got something that's like a big chip, you might want to think twice about maybe replacing the camshaft or seeing if you can get it resurfaced. Um, tiny little baby itty bitty chips. These are, you know, street motorcycles. They're not perfect. You can put it back together, run it. It's probably going to be fine for a while. Um, but if you have some big chips or scoring or anything that is pretty apparent and alarming, um, yeah, you should probably look into getting that fixed. But I don't need to adjust my valve, so I'm not gonna bother pulling all these out, but I will show you this. Got a little magnetic puller here. Let me go grab this guy, lift the right on out. So in here we have the shim. You can see that circular thing? That'll just pop right out. Measure that if you need to adjust your valves. You'll need to figure out how much thicker or thinner of a shim you need to put in to adjust the clearance by that much. So let's just say, for example, you have a valve that is 0.05 millimeters out of spec. You're going to need a shim that is 0.05 millimeters thinner than the shim that you have now to get it back within spec because that's going to open up that clearance if it's too tight. On the alternative side, if you have a valve clearance that is too loose, you're going to need a thicker shim. So if it's too loose by 0.05 millimeters, you're gonna need a shim that's 0.05 millimeters thicker. And of course you have that tolerance when you're doing this. I always try to get the valves as dead center in spec as possible. So again, spec for this engine, intake 0.1 millimeters to 0.2 millimeters. For the intake, 0.325 to 0.375 for the exhaust valves. I've got all of these actually were in right in the center of spec from the last time I adjusted them 3,000 miles ago. So 0.15 millimeters for all the intake and 0.35 for all the exhaust. So I'm gonna put that back in now and carry on getting the frame slider mounts off so that I can get my new cam chain in. Yeehaw.
All right, so the new chain is in and we went ahead and cleaned up everything in here. So next steps, I'm gonna change the spark plugs because this is when they're the most accessible. They're just right there. You don't need too deep of a socket to get in there. So we're gonna get those out, get the new ones in. And after that, we'll start putting the camshafts back in and getting the seals and everything. One more thing that you're gonna to wanna to replace, there are little O-rings that go here and here and here that seal the cam retainer, really the spark plug well basically where the cam retainer connects to that, so or the camshaft holder. So definitely order those O-rings. I'll add that at the beginning of the video for sure. But replace those when you're putting everything back together. Now once we have the cams in, we're gonna follow the specified torque sequence in the home. Then after we have the spark, then once we have the spark plugs in and the cams as well, we're gonna go ahead and follow the torquing sequence. But first, assembly lube. So as you can see, we've got the cams back in now and they're timed right on. So trick with this, when you have the chain, you wanna pick it up, go exhaust cam in first. You wanna get it timed totally even, get the timing marks going with the cylinder head, like so. And you wanna make sure there's absolutely no slack on the chain as it runs down through here with the crankshaft. And after that, you're gonna to need to wiggle the intake camshaft in. Now the trick with this one is you need to get it in kind of uh, too far to the left because as it seats properly with the chain, it's gonna straighten out and line up that way. But again, we've got intake, intake bolt on the intake side, exhaust, bolt next to an X for exhaust on the exhaust side. Those are nice and lined up even. And we've also got our crankshaft down here that is lined up nicely. Voila. So now we're gonna put some more assembly lube on the top sides of the camshafts, on the journals, on the lobes. I already lubed up the buckets and everything. Don't forget to lubricate these guides right here, this guy and this guy. It's gonna make sure that the cam holder seats properly and straight. Now that it is time to tighten all the bolts to secure the cam holder, we're going to go in the reverse order, which I have mapped out here for you. So same deal, you're just gonna go a little bit at a time with each bolt. You're probably gonna need to make five to 10 passes. In the clip that you just watched before this, you will see that I ran them in by hand just a little bit. This was not snugging them up. This was just taking up the bit of thread on the bolt that was extending out of the head so that I wouldn't have to turn so much with the ratchet. But again, I didn't even snug them up. 
So once you get to the point where they're pretty close to snug, you're gonna to wanna to start applying this torque sequence and just keep going until all of them are at their even torque values, which if I remember correctly is 10 Newton meters. All right, so the cam holder is torqued to spec. Timing is dead on. And I just rechecked the clearances just to be safe. Everything was right where it was before. So great stuff there. That's an important thing to do, especially if you do make adjustments. Don't just change the shims, put everything back together and assume it's good to go. Always after you've retorqued the cam holder to spec, go again, check the clearances again, and just make sure everything's totally right. Because you never know, the cam holder could have been over torqued like it was from the factory for me the first time I ever did the valves. The cam cover had never been removed before and the cam holder was way over torqued. It's, I, I don't even know what the foot poundage would have been, but you're only supposed to have 10 Newton meters on each of the bolts that holds that together. Of course, tightened in that special sequence, but oh man, there had to have been at least like 30, 40, foot pounds of torque on there. So that completely skewed my measurements the first time around. The first time I did the valves on this bike two years ago, had to go back and do it again after I changed the round a bunch of shims and everything was wrong. So it's just best practice to always recheck your clearances after you've adjusted the valves. And of course, before I went and turned the engine and actually before I even finished torquing the cam holder down, I went and reapplied tension to the cam chain with my manual tensioner. Again, I have the APE aftermarket manual cam chain tensioner. If you have an OEM one, you're gonna wanna put that back in when you're getting pretty close to snugging everything up, just to make sure that you're taking all the slack out of the chain. If you're replacing it, the chain's gonna be tight, so you might need to readjust it. And with the hydraulic OEM one, I think there's a way that you can do that. I'm not really sure what the process is. Just get an APE tensioner and put it in while you're doing this job much easier to use, but I've only had to adjust it once since I did the valves 3,000 miles ago and it was a minor adjustment. So, good thing to have, good thing to know. Make sure everything's all tightened up. You don't wanna be skipping teeth on your camshaft gears or on your crankshaft when you're going to turn the engines. Just, again, be careful to make sure that there is no slack in the chain. It's taken up by the tensioner and you'll be good to go. Check those clearances. If they're all good, button everything up. If they're not, I'm really sorry, but you've got more work to do. But I'm all good now, so I'm gonna go ahead and get the cam cover on with the new gasket. We changed the spark plugs already, so that's all set. And yeah, we're making progress here. We're gonna have the bike back together in no time. It's all the easy stuff from here on out.
All right, moment of truth. Seems like all's well. There we have it. Bike's all back together. She starts, she idles nicely, sounds totally normal. No check engine lights or anything weird going on. So really happy that everything went back together so smoothly and really happy that we were able to make sure that all of the valve clearances are in spec, get new spark plugs in there and replace that timing chain. Although that is not typically a point of failure for these engines, I did notice that my chain had stretched a little bit the last time that I did the valves, which made it difficult to time the cams perfectly in sync with the crankshaft. So this new chain allowed me to do that, and I'm really excited to see if there's any change in performance the next time I get the bike out on track, because the timing is dead on now. Like I said at the beginning of this video, this is a pretty involved job. It does take a good amount of time and a lot of attention to detail just to make sure you're not messing anything up. You are, again, if you have to adjust your valve clearances, playing with the timing of your engine, or if you're not careful turning the crankshaft when you're checking the clearances, you could very easily let the crank walk back, change slack on the chain, and have a tooth skip on the cam, in which case you gotta pull everything out to reset the timing. So as long as you're careful though, and just take your time with everything and dedicate time for this, do not try to start this job unless you have a good amount of time allocated to it. I would recommend dedicating at least a weekend the first time that you're gonna do it because you will run into some speed bumps and it's gonna take more time than the eight hours that it would take a mechanic at a shop to do it. As you probably noticed, I'm wearing a different shirt now and that's because this is the second day that I've been working on this project. I got started on a Saturday later in the day and had some things going on in between where I had to take breaks and stop. And then today, Sunday, I got started again at about 2 p.m. It's now about 6 p.m. So in total, I'd say eight to 10 hours. Triple check everything, especially as you're resetting time on your engine. But yeah, I'm really happy that I was able to get this job done. I'm really looking forward to getting the bike back out on track again, seeing if having the timing set that way and the new spark plugs make any noticeable difference in the power delivery of the bike. But most of all, I'm excited to get racing again and just have the peace of mind knowing that everything is in tip top shape. Follow the steps I've outlined here today, as well as all of the steps that are in a factory service manual or a Haynes service manual. I have a Haynes service manual. Don't try to do this job without it if you're doing it for the first time. It is an incredible resource and something that will help you do so much more with your motorcycle than just that. It's like 35 or 40 bucks on eBay or a motorcycling parts store. Go buy one. Don't try this job until you have one of those. It's a really nice resource to have and it's good to go in there, be able to find all the correct torque specs, the torque sequence for the cam holder, everything's in there. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this one up. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, found it useful or insightful, or just have a question about completing this job, go ahead and drop a comment below. Happy to have a conversation there. I would sincerely appreciate a gentle little click of the like button if you did find this useful, helpful, entertaining, insightful. 
And please consider subscribing if you haven't already. Really appreciate that as well. I'm putting out two videos a week. It's a combination of different things. Obviously, I've got the racing adventure I'm on, working on the bike, taking it out to the track, going as fast as I can. And I've also got my Toronto V4 factory back in the corner over here that I like to clown around on on the street, take to the racetrack occasionally, make some awesome sounds. So if you're into motorcycling content, like seeing someone go around a racetrack, like hearing the sounds of these incredible machines, definitely subscribe, turn those notifications on. Thanks again so much for watching and I'll hope to catch you in the next one. Until then, later.